Hello, and welcome to the Wiser Tomorrow podcast. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Terry Shoemaker, a lecturer at Arizona State University with the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies. His academic focus relates to religion in the United States, with an emphasis on religious change and contemporary life. He studies how religion and religious people adapt, convert, deconvert, reform, and abandon various aspects of their religiosity or spirituality. This episode, we suffered from a number of technical difficulties, all of which were due to my own connection and setup. Thankfully, Terry was incredibly patient, and we were nonetheless able to have a fascinating conversation about many of the topics that are at the heart of his research. So apologies for a bit of a drop in production quality, and I hope the conversation will still be as enjoyable to listen to as it was to have. Terry and I are hoping to continue our conversation in the future, so if you've enjoyed it, please consider subscribing for more conversations with Terry on these topics. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Terry Shoemaker. Okay, so I'm here with Dr. Terry Shoemaker, a lecturer at ASU with the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies. So again, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course. So uh, I like to just begin by asking every guest that comes on to give a bit of introduction in their own words. I will have, uh, have a pre-recorded introduction leading into the conversation, but if you're comfortable just giving a little bit of background about yourself and what you study and how you got here, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I guess to kind of go full circle with it, I um, grew up in South Central Kentucky where whether you're religious or not, uh, religion just kind of infiltrates all aspects of life and um, uh, grew up with um, very young parents who didn't quite not didn't quite know what to do with religion. And so um, because they left it open ended, I think that just drove me to have so many questions about it. And uh, initially went into the United States Navy as an assistant chaplain, which is known formally as a religious program specialist. And um, and even more questions emerged during my time there and uh, was fortunate enough once I got out of the Navy to uh, get a, uh, a minor in religious studies from Western Kentucky University, eventually a master's degree from there. And then in my 30s, um, was able to complete a PhD in religious studies at Arizona State University, where um, I ended up studying that Bible Belt religion that I grew up with, um, and then have moved into topics like religion and sports and the relationships there. Yeah, that's cool. So it sounds like you left Kentucky with a pretty positive taste in your mouth about religion, though. I'm sure it's more complicated than that, but overall, it sounds like you had a good experience. Mm, uh, well, yeah, it's a, it's a complex question. Uh, it's sure. interesting because personally, um, personally, I probably left Kentucky with a sour taste, um, about mm. kind of personal faith, uh, but left Kentucky academically very positive with a lot of routes and avenues to explore, uh, the questions that I had, which, in many ways is a much safer place for me uh, to do academic research rather than some sort of personal exploration in religion or faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So your interest, again, is not so much about any aspects of the religion itself. It's more of just how it interacts and influences society more broadly, correct? Yeah. I, I consider myself much more of a qualitative social scientist. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things I always try to tell my students is, um, I, I don't study what should be, I study what is. Um, and so by that, I simply mean that, you know, like I'm not studying anything so that I can prescribe how things ought to be. Um, uh, but more just studying, look, this is the way this exists in our society for better or for worse. And, um, and I hope that my role is to help people, including my students or any, readers of any of the books I've published uh, to simply understand certain phenomenon better. Mm -hmm. So with, with our conversation, of course, focusing around religion, I think it would be useful from the outset to 
start with a pretty general question, but I think one that's often overlooked, which is just what exactly constitutes a religion and what makes it distinct from other types of belief and ideology? Yeah, so this is, uh, this is let me say that's a really good starting point that uh, is often ignored. Um, so, and what I mean by that is uh, a lot of people have conversation about religion with the assumption that they're both working from the same premises, premises or definitions, uh, which honestly probably isn't exceptionally accurate. Um, now, I, I think the problematic part of the question is, uh, and this real, this, um, there's literally books written on this. So like, there's no way we can like do a, a full scale. Sure, yeah. Uh, sir, the, yeah, survey of, of what's the definition of religion, because honestly, there's probably not a universal definition of religion. Um, that a very, very brief, um, that I'll just touch on is that, um, uh, with religion as a concept of, and term is really brought about globally through Western colonization, um, for, uh, for Europeans, specifically the British and the Spanish they had an idea of what religion was uh, premised typically off of Christianity. And when they went out into the world, uh, they took with them uh, kind of note takers and, and people who were describing what they found, who were literally searching for things that looked like Christianity that they could call religion. And so a lot of the societies that they, they colonized, that they explored, simply didn't have a word that matched up. And to be honest with you, didn't have a concept. And so one of the things that's, that's difficult um, is for a lot of people, uh, because of that legacy of colonialism, religion is a belief system or a faith. So that it's internalized, it's subjective, it's private. I have my religious beliefs, you have your religious beliefs. But the reality is many of the things that were proclaimed as religions didn't have a list of core beliefs. Um, there were cultural practices that got kind of uh, categorized as religion, um, but th there weren't things called religion. So in, uh, in India and parts of Asia, there's Dharma, which is a way of life that is kind of like religion. Uh, there's things that are kind of spiritual that might be a little bit different. And so when it comes to religion, it really is an exceptionally difficult thing um, to kind of nail down exactly what it is. It's, you know, I, I think somebody said, and I forget who, something like, you know, religion when you see it. Um, and mm -hmm. that's a cop out, right? Like, uh, so like, you know, if it looks like religion, it's religion. I, I think, you know, in a lot of ways, we operate legally off of what gets accepted as religion by certain government systems. And so if it's accepted as a religious organization, then we accept it as a religion. Um, but even that is a, a grainy, grainy uh, position to take. So I wish I could be clearer on that. Uh, but it but it does get to your, your second part of your question is, you know, like what makes it unique? And, you know, the people that I'll give you, for instance, that study religion and sports, they would say, well, it's not unique. Um, religion is constituted by kind of rituals and practices and events and uh, kind of delineating what's sacred from the profane or the mundane. Um, and But that sports as a culture phenomenon does very similar things. And some I might say that politics is a religion for certain people. Um, I think Paul Tillich is the one that said religion is simply human's ultimate concern. And so if, if you go off of that definition, then you imagine there's, what did we just cross the 8 billion mark of human population? There's mm -hmm. 8 billion responses to what is religion because every single person potentially has it. Yeah. Every single person potentially has a different ultimate concern. Yeah. It's uh, it is amazing how it's, it's such a difficult conversation to have probably because there isn't anything close to a definition that anywhere close to a majority of people can agree upon. So at the end of the day, as you sort of suggested at the beginning, a lot of the times when I have conversations about religion in one respect or another, you very quickly realize you're just speaking over each other because you mean fundamentally different things. So it is it is a problem that probably deserves a little bit more yeah. effort just simply to have more productive dialogue. Yeah. So you already brought up the idea of uh, or the focus of your research being related to sports. 
So one of the questions I had was, what what's really the motivation for that? I mean, obviously, religion takes a special place in sports, and it's very prevalent in a way it's not in you know many other aspects of popular culture. But what is it for you that makes it worth studying as a key key research area? Um, yeah, that's a that's a really good question, and and I have to say uh, for any listeners out there who are kind of shaking their heads at this point and going, "What in the world, religion and sports?" <laughs> um, I was initially kind of skeptical of the relationship um, um, as far as a way that uh, these two phenomena could be studied together myself. Um, but I've, I've come around to it. And I think, well, let, let me say first, for me personally, as someone that that uh, studies Bible Belt religion and kind of fundamentalism and evangelicalism that has metastasized into something that some people are calling white Christian nationalism at this point. Um, to do studies with sports is a much healthier place for me to be um, because, uh, you know, studying kind of uh, extreme extremist versions of Protestantism and even some parts of some Catholic groups now um, can really wear you down mentally and emotionally. Um, and so uh, when I got the chance to kind of jump into the religion and sports topic, my goal uh, was um, to try to think about it a little bit differently than what others had been doing at the time. So one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Eric Bain Selbo, uh, literally wrote the book about, uh, I think the title of it is something like Understanding Sport as Religious Phenomenon. Um, who makes the argument mm. that sports are religious. Uh, I, I don't know that I, uh, I don't know that that is um, as convincing to me. Um, I think uh, sports and religions are human ventures and therefore will share similarities um, in, in much of what they do. But I, I wanted to, um, to kind of examine um the relationship of religion and sports um, from from different vantage points. And so one of the, the projects I did was um, I interviewed a group of people who had deconverted from their family's faith tradition, uh, which which can be quite divisive sometimes um, if the, the family kind of holds that tradition fairly tightly. And um, one of the things I discovered was um, is that during those instances, uh, religion is often uh, relegated off the table um, as a moot point because it's divisive. And so if you're going to, you know, remain loving family members, you got to ignore that part of the conversation. Uh, and then politics are typically these days connected uh, to uh, religious commitments. And so those were set aside and we can't talk about that now. And, and so sports became, uh, and sports commitments, their fandoms became a place where they could set aside a lot of their disagreements and root for their college team or their professional team and wear the same colors and talk trash about their competitors and uh, where there were some real resonances that remained. Um, and so that, you know, like, I think, I think that was a hopeful spot for a lot of the people that I interviewed um, because it was a safe place for everybody involved. Um, and so, you know, that was one of the projects I did. Now I'm currently writing a, an introductory textbook on religion and sport, which which explores some different angles um, of the topic. So hopefully that'll be coming out uh, probably in a couple of years or something. Nice. Well, that's exciting. And then I, ho I hope ASU will pick that up and incorporate that into their curriculum. So you mentioned that, you know, it's sort of an outlet for a lot of people who couldn't express sort of religious tendencies other indirectly, I suppose. But I guess several decades ago, you know, middle of the 20th century, for example, there was still a much higher degree of, of comfort and willingness for people to engage on religious topics. But would, would you say that at that time that religious religion was still comparably prevalent in sports? Did it play a similarly dominant role or how has that changed over the last, let's say, 50 years? Yeah, that's a that's a really good, really good question. So if 50 years would be looking at the 50s, 60s and 70s. Um, immediately, mm -hmm. I think of um, athletes like Muhammad Ali, um, who is converting to Islam and proclaiming Elijah Muhammad 
um, as, as the prophet out loud in, in many interviews, but then I'm also um, thinking um, that, that there seems to be the religion and sports are definitely connected, but I think life is much more car- compartmentalized in the, say the fifties, sixties, maybe the sixties is starting to break that down where, um, things, things are, a well, I don't want to say black and white because that kind of gets to kind of the, the racial structures, um, uh, that, that also existed mm-hmm. during that time, but, uh, th- things are delineated more. So there's, there's um, now obviously people are pushing back against this. So I'm not like holistically describing an entire society with broad brush, uh, broad brushes, but, but people knew you went to work and that was work. And then you came home and that was home and you went to church or mosque or synagogue. And that was that. And then you watched your favorite sports teams and that was that. And, And life was, life was maybe a bit more, um, maybe reductionist is a, is a word we could use where um, I know what is what um, and and it's clear, right? Like this is the, I mean, and so, you know, a lot of, to give you an example, a lot of older people today, you know, they still say, you know, back in the day when girls were girls and boys were boys, right? Like the gender roles were very distinct. And again, not everybody fit into that model, uh, back then, but uh, but that was the assumption everybody was kind of working from, um, and so they're, they're probably you know like when people think about this um, historic historically, I think the religion and sports topic would would go to much more what we call civil religion, and civil religion is this this idea proposed by a sociologist named Robert Bella that. Um, that with the emergence of the nation state, what inevitably happens, and this this is tracked through history, uh, with the emergence of the nation state, um, religious authority diminishes. Um, and so the nation state takes over more legal authority over our lives. And what Bella proposed was, is that where we had religious, relig- sorry, religion as um, the utmost place where we we gave our loyalties and and kind of bowed the knee so to speak that uh the rise of the nation state diminished uh, religious authority and people started bowing the knee to the the nation state more and so this is you know we we pledge our allegiance right uh, to the nation state, and that's expected of all citizens, but it's not expected of all United States citizens that we would all go to church or we would all be part of the same religious tradition. Um, and so what Bella actually said was going to church was actually, or, or going, just being religious in the United States was part of your civil religious duty. And so in, in some ways, uh, 50s, in the 50s, we add in under God and our, our Pledge of Allegiance, Um there starts to be um, really with the Cold War, there starts to be much more talk of um, the United States as a Christian nation. There starts to be an embedding of patriotic rituals like uh, national anthems during sporting events. Um, and so in many ways, that connection between sports and religion and the nation state is civil religious. And that's where we start to see the emergence of these things. And this is, I think, why Muhammad Ali um, and, and people like Muhammad Ali are outspoken uh, that use their Islamic faith, that the, his nation of Islam uh, originally uh, faith and as, a, as a means to push back against the United States. Um, and so it's all intertwined. It's all interconnected during that time. Um, and, and now I think between politics, religion, sports, uh, I it's, it's hard to, it's hard to actually point to something that's not political in the United States. I mean, once Chick-fil-A and Nike shoes become political, I think everything's political, thus religion's political. Um, and that's kind of where we're at now. Yeah. So several, several comments and questions to that. One is the way that you sort of described and, and detailed civil religion is almost as if it sounds like there's a bit of an assumption that there's some compulsion of, for people to seek some level of authority and 
and have it run by a, a bigger, greater, grander organization. So if one goes away, it will simply just be substituted by another. So I'd be curious what you think about that. Yeah, so that's a that's a really good question because your question is is about authority. Um, and if you're going to talk about authority, you have to talk about the the famous sociologist Max Weber, um, whose uh, whose real interest was in authority. And, and what Weber says that in the the modernized industrialized world in which we live, three types of author- authority emerge. Um, and the first is legal rational authority. This is the nation state. This is think about all the ways that we. Uh, if you're going to get married. You know, you have to have uh, have it um, certified by the state. Um, if you're going to drive a car, it has to. You have to get like authority from the state to drive your vehicle. Um, we literally, uh, what we want to think of ourselves as as like these free, independent agents, but the reality is, we really are. Um, uh, we really do. Let me put it this way: we really, really do give quite a bit of our personal autonomy over to the state in exchange for safety and, and other things. It's a transactional kind of relationship. The second authority he he does, uh, he discovered was traditional authority. And this is always, uh, the way I was explaining to my students is the question of um, uh, when we want to ask things like, well, why do we do that? And no one seems to know the answer. That's usually traditional authority. And so this is this is patriarchal authority. Um, why are the men the head of the ha- household? Well, we don't know. It's just the way things ought to, ought to be, right? I mean, you kind of hear that kind of from, from an older generation. We, I'm not saying that's real or accurate or whatever. I'm just saying mm-hmm. uh, that there's a traditional type of authority uh, that exists in the world that, that we accept to a certain extent. Now, we want to push back against both the legal and um, the traditional. Oftentimes, we, we want to resist those things, but we tend to operate in our daily lives, maybe not even intentionally recognizing those authorities, but living in such a way that we recognize those authorities. And then the third that Weber found was actually what he called charismatic or prophetic authority. And this is, um, he used, he used charismatic in the sense of, of, um, uh, charisma of kind of a mysterious gift. Like he didn't know why people would follow or grant authority to certain people. Um, and these are, for him, these are religious figures. This is Muhammad. This is Jesus. This is Hartha. Um, but this is also, you know, uh, you know, like in a, in a kind of a mixture of authorities, this would be a Jim Jones. This would be a Hitler. Uh, like, man, when we ask those questions, why do we, why did anybody ever listen to those people at all? And so, so it is interesting that, you know, the, the question to get to your question more specifically of of really kind of uh, the question of authority, the way we grant authority, and thus, if one authority becomes obsolete, do we simply re- replace it with another? And for Bella, we definitely have. And part, you know, the question becomes: Is it something in humanity that um, that we tend to give ourselves over to authorities, or is it something that is kind of uh, nurtured within us? Um, and I think it's it's probably it's definitely nurtured in many ways. Um, but, but I don't know that it's inherent. I live in Arizona where people tend to think that we're absolutely free and Liberty is everywhere, but I'm not sure that's the case. Um, you know, where in Arizona and in Phoenix, where they really tout freedom, everybody wants to live in an HOA and then give the HOA authority over what you can do at your house. Um, it's, it's what one scholar called, um, we we it's freedom from freedom um and i think that's what a lot of people really want to tout and proclaim something about freedom as a concept but then need a structure in their lives and authority comes in to give them that structure um and i think that makes life much simpler for many many people and so i think that's the easy way to go now do people obviously resist that authority of course do people push back against that authority Obviously, but at the end of the day, I mean, if you think about, you know, in the United States, we talk about our polarization um, and we talk about the red wave and the blue. And um, the reality is we're fighting over what that authority should look like. And actually, who's the most patriotic to the authority? That's the essence of our conversations right now in our country. 
um, which only gets back to the the root of like we all really like our authority and our structure, and we want it to be shaped the way that we want it to be shaped. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because uh, going off of that, there's a lot of times now we now we truly get into a bit of tricky territory because I'm of course trying to avoid making any value judgments or any, anything of the kind, but I'll speak as generally as possible. There's a lot of times where I think religion is seen as the root cause of a number of different issues, whether it's in the political sphere or elsewhere. But I suppose a more accurate way to to paint the picture is that it's the instantiation of the institutions as they are today, and then how they sort of settle in into the, the broader picture. So it seems like the debate is always sort of centered around religion or no religion, but it's probably, at least practically speaking, more appropriate to beg for religious reform and and a higher quality of introspection and and evaluation of how these institutions are being run and how it plays with people's desire for authority and leadership. Yeah, that's a, that's a probably. I think I would I would agree with you. Um, and this is um, a lot of people have devoted their lives to trying to reform re- religious institutions, and I think there's a lot of work that goes on there um, because. We are we are we are beings that love patterns uh, and consistency, um, and so uh, religion provides the consistency for us. And so, a, a lot of people um, even, you, that don't like the speed at which reformation occurs, um, but they still want the reformation to occur. Um, is you know, and they. We, as Americans, we love our institutions, um, and 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 we think those institutions are inherently good because we trust humans that are in those institutions. We just feel like somehow the institutional structure has gone as gone astray, gone awry, or whatever, and that a little tweaking they can be fixed. Um, and so this is you know why you'll see a lot of people invest their energies. Um, in Reformation rather than the the idea, I think, of, um, I mean, think, well, the thing that pops in my mind is these, I, these, these notions that defund the police or defund higher education or defund NPR. Um, it's funny that no one actually means that. They just mean like, like realign it and uh, make it do what we want it to do, right? Like, like fix it. That's what we mean by defund. We don't mean to get rid of it. I don't think, I don't think people are that extreme in the United States. Um, and so we, we like our authority. We just want to reform it sometimes to fit us better. Um, it's almost like resoling a shoe or something. Uh, we really like those shoes. They're worn out. They're a bit antiquated, but man, if, if you can go to a good cobbler and they can fix that sole for you, Maybe this is a whole metaphor for the soul of the nation or something. Um, they can <laughs> mm-hmm. they can fix that soul for you. That way you can still you can still have those shoes. That's what we want. That's what we want, really. No, definitely. But I might actually have some point of disagreement just in terms of of how extreme people might be, and that's in both directions. Because you know, I, I can think of people personally that I've had conversations with who. I mean, whether they really believe it in their heart is one thing, but at least outwardly, they're very happy to say that when they say defund the police, they mean it quite, quite literally. But, you know, institutions are typically more of a left leaning thing, I guess, to to promote their their size and degree of power. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have a lot of, of right wing people who have com- seemed to have completely abandoned all faith in institutions. They want the smallest government physically possible and it goes well beyond government as well. So it seems like there's a, there is a significant degree of, of extremism from both sides of the political aisle. Yeah, I, I would, I would completely agree with you on that. Um, but, but I think calling for small government is still in support of the government institution, right? Uh, True. Again, it's the, mm-hmm. the, I want that institution. I just want it to cater to how I want it to be. Um, and the, the, uh, with the with the police, I I I don't know. I I think I, I'm with you. I don't know that people that actually 
uh, proclaim defund the police mean to absolutely get rid of the police? Because people certainly do like safety and security um, in their, their neighborhoods and community. And, and even if they don't want that institution, I would imagine they would want to replace that with a different safety and security institutional mechanism. Um, and so, again, they may not like the way that institution is, but they want a version of that tailored to how they think it ought to operate. Yeah, surely. That is a good point. You're, you're completely right. Um, okay, so we can shift back. I have a few more questions about religion and sports, just because, again, I find it to be, I think, a lot more interesting than most people would give it credit for. And a bit of a, a goofy question and direction is simply just how you feel about the idea of, let's say, uh, separation of religion and sports, because the thing is, there's, I suppose it can be broken down into two paths, two categories, one of which is how religious, how sports may itself sort of function as a religion. Other is how religion specifically is incorporated into sports. And one example off the top of my head is something like, I believe the Utah Jazz, their their team song is Hava Nagila, which is is funny for a, a whole set of reasons. But there are many instances of, of religion more explicitly playing a role in sports. So is your interest sort of more of the former or the latter or a bit of both? Um, that's a, it's a really good question because I think you offer, um, uh, two ways, uh, to think about the relationship of religion and sport. The one is an absolute overlap that sports, um, either mirror mimic or function, uh, like religion. Um, and, and that's definitely one avenue you can take in the conversation. The other one is simply how, um, religion gets into sports. Um, and then we can actually say the opposite. Um, we could actually take another angle. Sports gets into religion uh, and religious institutions often as well. Um, I think from those two perspectives, I think the first, the former is actually um, the more interesting, to be honest. It's, it's the one that says, um, and this gets back to the whole question of displacement and replacement as well. And then also actually gets back to your question about authority. So um, uh, the United States, it's, it's been much slower compared to its European counterparts, but we are a secularizing nation. And what I mean by that is um, we've, we've seen a trend of people disaffiliation with religious institutions, uh, with religious categories, um, and giving less of their time, energy, and money to um, uh, religious rituals and things like that. And so one of the arguments that is made by people like uh, my colleague, Dr. Eric Bing Selbo, is that, uh, that humans, uh, let me see, I, I don't know that he would say it exactly this way, so I, I just wanna do that caveat there, that this is, this is me trying to describe this position and not him, but um, that humans are inherently in the term that is used is some is, is homo religiosus. So all that means is that humans um, are inherently religious. Now, what that means is it doesn't mean that we're we're all predisposed to go to a church or mosque or synagogue or whatever. It it, it more means that humans search out something that is that is special, that is sacred versus the mundane. Um, and this this can look like a lot of different things, um, but as but as people disaffiliate with religion, searching for that sacredness, then some would argue that humans uh, innately seek out the sacred still in other places, and so then sports will step in for that. Um, and so, just to give you a few examples, um, sports is embedded with superstitions. It's embedded with curses. Um, it's embedded with, with all these, these ritualized practices of, I'm not going to take my Jersey off. I'm not going to change my socks. Right. Um, or, um, I'm, I'm going to watch my team, but I need so-and-so to be here with me because last time that person was here with me, the team won, and, and I really want them to win again. Uh, there's the whole mystery surrounding the outcome of the game that I think is really, really interesting. Um, and you know, and you think of people, they've got their jobs, they've got family responsibilities, say that they, they're not committed to religion anymore. Well, then what's special in their lives? 
Um, and there can be several of these outlets, but one of those potentially is sports, right? That they really throw themselves into committing to their team. Um, kind of that's their identity. And so um, it becomes very something very special and sacred to them. And so that's the religion as, religion as sports kind of angle. Um, I actually really, I, I think the, the religion in sports angle uh, is typically interesting to historians and sociologists. Um, and for historians to kind of mine, you know, kind of those Muhammad Ali examples, like something like that, Billy Sunday kind of comes up. Uh, in my mind, who was this evangelist preacher who used to be a professional baseball player. Um, so he, he kind of preaches at, at some sporting venues and things like that and uses sporting metaphors. Um, but then just the sociological, I, I, I've got this great article um, from this this African scholar discussing um, discussing soccer. And I'm almost positive it's Zimbabwe. If it, I apologize if it's not. Um, but one of the things that, that he does a great job of describing in this article is the way that, uh, Christianity, African religious traditions, and, um, and there's one other that's slipping my mind, all the fans literally bring these things to the stadium and they're burning incense and they're, they're singing these religious hymns. And like, it doesn't matter if you're one or the other, you do them all trying to like uh, some sort of uh, incur some sort of favor for your team uh, at the time. So I don't, you know, I don't know that there's, there's getting a, get individuals are, are individuals and they're going to carry kind of their cultural components with them wherever they go. And so um, I think that's an interesting way to look at it um, as well. Now the question becomes um, should those fans or should athletes be able to bring their religiosity into those spaces? Is it off-putting? Is it divisive? I think that's a that's a that's a really interesting question. That um, that uh, this is one of the assignments I have my students do and to explore. Uh, that if if someone is overly religious and say it's an athlete on a team, then that actually might be quite divisive to the other teammates, right? Like if this person is really really committed to a particular religious tradition and they feel compelled that they should attempt to proselytize others and to be like them. You can imagine some teammates might get quite frustrated with that if that occurs more often than not. Um, uh, if, if fans are doing a religious ritual that is uh, quite distracting in the stands, right? There's, there's a limit to it. If a fan wants to privately pray for the outcome of the game or whatever, that's probably acceptable. Um, if the fans actually wanted to say sacrifice a goat for the success of the team, probably not acceptable in many venues. And so, um, so there's limits to this, right? It's not like just a free for all. Um, and so I think those things are, are, it's part of that social contract that gets negotiated and rarely ever has to actually be like mediated per se. Uh, so I, both the angles you mentioned are really, really interesting and fascinating. Um, and, and I really like reading both of those perspectives. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there because I feel like I'm rambling at this point. I could, I could talk about this stuff for days. Well, no worries. That's exactly why I asked you to, to come on. And what I love about this is, you know, I came into it already genuinely feeling that this was all a very interesting topic. But, you know, in, in 30, 40 minutes of us speaking, it goes to show, I think a lot of people hear something like all oh, religious and sports as a, as a serious academic discipline. And they they just, they wave it aside. They They assume it's just academics in their ivory tower doing who knows what but the reality is it's it's an incredibly rich topic that touches on so many more fundamental things so the rambling is is very welcome it's it's all fascinating and uh following that i wanted to ask it's it's very different than sports in a lot of ways but you know there's a as a lot of people really leave their their traditional organized religions they they kind of by definition go one of only a few places one option is to a different organized religion. Perhaps they had an issue specifically with, with the religion they were practicing previously. The next is to go to some uh, more interfaith type of spirituality, which is probably going to be defined by them and quite modular. And then the third is, is atheism. And the thing with atheism is it seems today that atheism has really become the religion of science. And that isn't to say that isn't I don't mean to suggest that that's either positive or negative, but 
a lot of the things that you we talked about in the beginning, trying to get at exactly what a religion is, seems to be prevalent in the case of atheism. And then that purpose, that excitement, that greater meaning is found through a pursuit of explaining the world around you. So do you see atheism or I'm, I'm not sure the right word, but sort of trying to replace a scientific understanding of the world to suffice as a, as a type of religion in a certain respect? So, so it's a really, really interesting setup to your question. And, and I think um, from my perspective, what I'm gathering is kind of the um, intellectually can, can reason and rationality replace kind of religious myths and stories um, is, is kind of mm-hmm. the question and, and, the, and the possibilities there. Um, it, to, to be honest with you, I, I don't know if it's enough. Um, and, and I, and I hesitate on this because, um, I like to think of myself as a, a rational being in the world. And, and I like to think that it's enough. I mean, one of the examples I use with my students, um, is science tells us what happens when the, the body stops, right? Like when the heart starts, pump, stops pumping, when the lungs start stop breathing and the and brain waves stop um it's death right and that's the end of that particular person's existence and and for many people in the world they know the scientific explanation that is offered they're simply not satisfied with that explanation and so to, whether that's an afterlife or some sort of connecting with some some sort of broader supernatural something um, whether, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I struggle with this question a lot. Um, in thinking, I, I actually think, you know, you offered three options of a different religious tradition and interfaith kind of thing, or atheist. I, I think there's actually more avenues and options than that. I think one of them is kind of a personal spirituality, um, that, that a lot of people are choosing where, um, they may actually find some of the religious resources that just kind of work for them. Um, I think for a lot of people in the contemporary world that is highly, still highly industrialized, uh, techno, te- uh, maybe technocratic, uh, with a huge emphasis on technology. I think for a lot of people, it's, it's very uh, Thoreau and Walden-esque. It's very nature uh, is the answer reconnecting with the planet is, is somewhat of, of kind of the response that, that we've seen, uh, which isn't quite atheism, right? Like um, you, uh, for, for many very strict atheists, the, the world is very mechanical. Um, it operates under certain rules and premises and laws, and, and that's what is. But, but kind of a, a nature spirituality would, would push back against that a little bit and say, no, there's some sort of connectivity there that science hasn't quite found yet. Um, and that when science catches up, it, it'll understand it better. Um, but, and so I don't know. I don't know that um, specifically for people that are trained up, nurtured, discipled, uh, conditioned, whatever, in a particular religious tradition, whether They are told that there's something sacred, that there's something special. There's something special about being a human in the world, right? A lot of these are anthropocentric. Um, To to then leave that uh, and completely abandon those notions, I think, maybe happens over time. But but I think that's some of the last, maybe what Freud would call the last remnants, uh, kind of the leftovers of religion. Um, And so I don't know. Maybe this is, you know, maybe it takes three, four generations for that to work out. And then we all become rational agents. Um, But I'm not convinced of it because I'm not sure that humans are absolutely rational. I think we're emotional. I think we're passionate. um, And I I think we make decisions based off of all kinds of other things versus our rationality. So I don't know that we'll ever completely swap uh, religious stories and myths and chasing after the sacred or something special uh, for some sort of like absolute rationality um, that then progresses humanity. That was Freud's thought. I, I just don't, I, I haven't seen it. And, and I'm not sure that that's, that's the human trajectory or not. Hmm. 
I would I would have to agree. I mean, whether whether or not it's good or bad, and there are, I can easily imagine many arguments different ways. Uh, yeah, I'm not hedging my bets on that becoming reality for for better or for worse. But you know, you you brought up the idea of of a more amorphous sort of spirituality. So um, in relation to that, I was I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about what religious demographics look like broadly in the U.S. today. And what the biggest trend moving forward is expected to be? Is it is it a rekindling of some of these traditional religious groups, or is spirituality sort of expected to reign supreme, at least in terms of uh, the largest category of religiosity in the U.S.? Yeah, uh, that's a, that's a really good question. And, and uh, to be honest with you, uh, and I know this isn't everybody's um, uh, everybody's favorite thing, but. Uh, I love the sociological data on this um, that comes out. Uh, what what we've seen, especially since uh, what we've seen really since the 50s and the 60s and then really catalyzed in the 90s is um, uh, an explosion, um, a, a great trend of people abandoning, uh, disaffiliating with religiosity. Um, and this this comes in a couple of different ways um, in, in the academic world, the way that we parse it out. It's it's not a full fledged move towards atheism. As a matter of fact, in the United States, people who identify as atheists are still a very small percentage, to be honest with you. And 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 in the United States, um, we've seen a. Uh, this is just a side note. We've seen a lot of um, a lot of a lot of movement with. Uh, there's a question that's always asked that that kind of gauges people's perspectives. And one of the questions that's always asked on surveys is, um, would you vote for a person who identifies as? And then it's like Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, yada, yada, yada. And we've actually seen over the years, we, we've actually seen some positive movements of, of people being more acceptable of, say, Islam, uh, of Muslims, of, of people of non-traditional, -tradition, uh, I'm sorry, non-Christian faith tradition, since Christianity has kind of been the dominant faith tradition in the United States. What we haven't seen much movement on, though, is people saying things like, I would vote for someone who identifies as atheist. Um, and so in the United States, there's still kind of a skepticism, uh, maybe an associative. I'm not saying this is right, but there's still kind of that that stereotype that somehow atheism equals immorality and, and, and atheists wouldn't make a good leader. Again, not saying that's the case. But it, but it seems to be kind of present in the United States. Um, what we've what we've seen a lot of in in the demographic shifts um, are what we call uh, the religious nuns, and this is super confusing. But it's it's n o n e s, uh, and these are the people on a survey or a census who, when asked the question. Um, with which religion do you affiliate? And then there's all these options. The very last box is none. And so we've seen a drastic increase in the people checking that none box. Again, this doesn't mean they're atheist. It means for some reason in the United States, people are becoming less willing to associate with particular religious traditions. Now, at the same time, uh, there is a decrease in uh, participants in religious communities. Um, it doesn't matter which part of which flavor of Christianity you're a part of, it is it is uh, decreasing. Um, and as a matter of fact, I, I don't know of any what we would call the traditional religious world religions. Um, I don't know of any of those that are actually growing in the United States. What we are seeing that's growing in the nuns category are the people who identify either as simply spiritual or people who identify as spiritual but not religious. Um, I think that spiritual but not religious is a very distinct uh, identifier that that for some reason somebody needs to reference uh, what they're not in proclamation to what they are. Uh, this is obviously isn't everybody. A lot of people simply say I'm spiritual, but there's a but there's a portion of those people that say spiritual but not religious. I think which really really um, points to uh, the hesitancy for many people um, to associate themselves with with religious groups in the United States. Um, and these people are just all over the board. Um, it's really, really hard to, to map uh, one, one, like where do you go to meet these people and interview them and survey them to find out what's going on? It becomes quite problematic. 
but this is everything from yoga practices to Reiki to meditation to reading certain religious texts. Um, it's a little bit of a of a buffet table, um, and if you it, and that's that's one of the the analogies. And if you imagine you and I are going down a, an actual food buffet, uh, our plates are going to look different at the end of it. And so if someone is a, we might say, a consumer of spiritual resources and religious resources, uh, by the time they get done, um, what they've assembled for themselves probably isn't going to look like the other the person sitting beside of them. And so it, it, it becomes very difficult to talk about who these people are, what they're doing, how they're doing it. One of the ways to, to get at it is to actually look at um, uh, uh, what we might call like spiritual shopping or uh, a spiritual marketplace. And so then you could see websites, you can see these groups online, you could ask questions about, well, what are these people consuming? What are they buying? What are they spending their money on? And I think that that is a, that, um, will will show some of insights of what people are into right now, uh, whether it's certain podcasts or meditation apps. Uh, these things are all over the board, um, and I think quite interesting. Um, and 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 for me, um, this is probably spirituality is the direction I'm moving in a lot of what I'm doing right now. Um, and so then thinking about like uh, these individualized sports like skateboarding and parkour things like that as more of a spiritual exercise um, instead of a kind of a religious exercise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting you say that. I've been skateboarding pretty much my entire life and I've not once until this moment sort of considered it from that perspective, but I can definitely see where people are coming from in that sense. It does, does touch on a lot of the things that we've, we've talked about throughout the conversation. And it, it largely brings us back to the first question, which is, what is religion? Because again, uh, it's not so clear why some people would separate some of these ideas from from a religion, but I suppose they certainly do feel that way. And what what do you think uh, is is responsible for the bad taste in people's mouths with with atheism, for example? I mean, one thing I've heard time and time again is citing historical figures who, you know, some of the worst, the, the most atrocious people in, in recorded history, you know, Stalin, Mao Zedong, whether, I, I'm actually not well versed in terms of just how true that was, but these are the people I think that, that conjure to the mind when people think atheist. So do you think that it's founded in some sort of historical precedent of what atheists do when they're in power? Or do you think it's more of just, it's a, it's a lack of understanding of how somebody can be motivated to do good without having a clear and explicit greater purpose or, you know, moral confinement to keep them in check? Um, yeah. So I, I think there's probably several responses to your question. Um, and I don't know that there's like a, a single factor uh, driving mm -hmm. the suspicion and skepticism of, of atheists uh, within specifically within the United States. Um, one, one of the things that I would point to though, that I, that I think is actually very impactful specifically for, um, generations that, um, what well, for generations today, because whether we want to admit it or not, we're, we're impacted by what occurred in the forties and the fifties. And that, that older generation today, um, um, has really, really, again, whether we want to admit it or not has, has significantly influenced our society and, uh, our parents and then, um, how that kind of trickles down to us. And for people that grew up during the cold war era, um, communism is equated to atheism, which is equated to evil. And so I think that's an, that is a, a very specific instantiation where, um, politicians from presidents to, to locals, um, were, were able to, uh, set themselves up as godly people directly in, um, uh, directly in reference to godless atheists who were immoral. And so again, whether, whether we think those things directly or not, I think, I think there's uh, remnants of those ideas that, that still uh, percolate and, and, and often even permeate our society. Um, you know, even during the, the January 6th insurrection, the, 
the guy from Arizona that, um, oh my gosh, what the shaman, the QAnon shaman mm-hmm. or whatever he proclaimed himself as when, when he mm-hmm. uh, made it to the Senate, he actually prayed, he actually prayed out loud. And one of, one of the things he said was he thanked God that, um, that day they were proclaiming, uh, something like, you know, proclaiming the true God against the godless communist. And so for a lot of people, I I think younger generations, it's like, well, what does that even mean? Like, Mm -hmm. who's he talking to or talking about at this point in history? Um, But that's an inherited kind of language and inherited ideas that for for many people of an older generation still resonates. Um, Communism is atheism, which is evil. And it's a very simple formula it's a very simple political formula that gained traction all the way through Reagan, um, who ended up using it and describing the United States as a city on a hill, uh, kind of a religious language. And he's indicating we're Christian, we're religious, therefore we're good, um, you know, and we're democratic and all. And, and the way those things are, are conjoined, uh, again, to use uh, Reagan language, trickles down. Um, mm-hmm. into our every day. And, uh, and, you know, many, many uh, uh, parents raise their kids with those ideas. Um, and even if, you know, they're, they don't get passed along in, in the purest forms, there's still something there. And, um, and, and we, we responded to post-World War II much differently than our European counterparts. Um, who experienced the devastation firsthand on the ground. We, we came back from post-World War II calling it the greatest war ever and kind of celebrated our victory and then celebrated our economic expansion after that. And so like those were all, you know, that, that set in motion a momentum. And then when people were trying to like explain, well, why? Well, then we must be good. We must be godly. We must be God favored. We must be divine, things like that. Um, and it, it, I don't know that it was, that's a healthy way to kind of look at life in general. Um, but it, it definitely is an impactful way, uh, of looking at it. Um, and then that gets transmitted, uh, through generations. Again, a younger generation is challenging this. Um, but I think the, the antecedents of that for the United States in today's world goes back to, uh, post-World War II, Cold War era. No, Definitely. Yeah, it's it's the amount that of 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 topics that is worth unpacking right there is. I would love to have another conversation with you in the yeah. future if you're ever available because we're we're basically at the one hour mark and I don't want to keep you too long. But in general, really, thank you so much. This has been fascinating. I'm, I have my list of questions open and I have a small portion that I that I had hoped to get to, which goes again just to show how how rich of a topic it really is. So. Again, if you're if you're interested in talking again, maybe sometime in the future, I'd love to continue this, and I will uh, fix whatever this this delay issue is because <laughs> that also adds a throws a wrench into it. Yeah, <laughs> it does, and and yeah, let's uh, let's plan something in the future uh, to talk more. Um, obviously, um, I think it's obvious that uh, I really like talking about these things because I could just talk for days. Um, but, um, but yeah, we didn't even really get into say Christian nationalism and, and things like that. So, uh, there's still, still, there's still at least a part two and maybe a part three, uh, in the future. So, so just let me know. That would be amazing. And perhaps, you know, by the way, I don't remember if I mentioned, I'm actually based in, uh, Phoenix, so I'm not far at all. So if you ever want to try, give okay. it a try in person or anything like that, I'm very happy to do so really whatever your preferences. Uh, that sounds, that sounds great. It would, it, you know, I've always wanted to do a live podcast somewhere. So I wonder if there's not like a library that would host this conversation, uh, or something like that. Uh, I think that would be a fascinating venue and and the people that it would attract for this conversation. I would be really interested to see who those people are. Um, uh, but I think there are people interested in this who would want to hear it in person. Um, and that would be a, uh, it's also an unscripted and a, a little scarier too, um, but um, but would be a fascinating uh, experiment to do as well. Yeah, absolutely. Let's let's just go ahead and try to plan that. I mean, we can consider what the options are: a library, 
I mean, a podcast studio is obviously nice, but it doesn't really invite any opportunity for an audience. So, but if, yeah, if you, if you were interested in, in trying to give that a go, I would love to really. Yeah. Yeah. I, w- I would. Uh, yeah. I think it'd be fascinating. Okay, great. Well, I'll, I'll reach out via email and we'll try to figure something out. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thanks so much for having me today. It was a great conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Appreciate your time and uh, I'll follow up with you shortly.